how many of you have attended a conference where I've helped you with your business? Could I see your hands? Great. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to share seven steps for any business to be successful from inception all the way to growth. Now, we're not going to get into things such as leadership and managing people, and there's a, a gazillion books on that. In fact, there's a gazillion books on everything today. One of the questions we no longer ask in our society is, what did you do before? Now, I'm a, I'm a big reader, as you well know, but we as a society, okay, you wrote this book, or you have this blog, or you do this thing, or you even do this training. What did you do? Like, what, what, what did you do? Well, I wrote a book. But what did you do before you wrote the book? I did an interview one time on TV, and there was a lady who had launched a national bestseller about how to buy your first home. And her publisher told me she used the proceeds from the sale of the book to buy her first home. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean the book was not valuable or there wasn't good information in it. Are you guys with me, yes or no? You see, in English, the English language, it's a limited language. Other languages have far more color to them. So, for example, in English, you say the word love, and you use the word love for everything. I love you, and I love ice cream, okay? But here's the thing. The Greeks, they have three words for everything. They got three words for love, and it's more descriptive, has more value. The Greeks had three words for knowledge. So they would say there's a, there's a head knowledge, a gnosis. There's a heart knowledge. That's the intuition and feel. And then there's this thing called experiential knowledge, which the Greeks valued at their highest, as their highest intellectual value, and it was epignosis is the word. Epignosis is experiential knowledge. And speaking from experience is a big thing, and that's what I've always promised every audience that I would ever do, is that I would always speak from experience. For as many years as we've had kids, people have asked Beverly and I to do conferences on parenting. And we said, not until our kids are grown. Because we should be able to teach our principles, trot our kids out, let them sit on a stool. We should be able to leave the building, and then people could ask them questions, and everything would align. Because it's experiential knowledge. Are you guys with me? Uh, when I teach on finance, it's, it's from a guy who was a broke immigrant, made it all, lost it all, and then made it all again, and then made it so that it can never be lost. So I speak from experience. Well, I have never shared my experience as a businessman. You know, I'm at Buffini and & Company, and I've this coaching company, a lot longer than I had my real estate career. And we have become the premier coaching and training company in the United States. And I want to share with you the principles we've used that other people have used that are this common thread for any business to be successful. Now, if you already own a business sitting here today, you want to go through these seven steps, and you want to find out which one of these in your business needs tweaking, enhancing, or you need to be reminded of and rededicated to. If you're thinking of starting a business, this would be a great roadmap for you. No matter what business, what industry, these principles will hold up. You guys ready for this? All right. So let me give you point number one. And when I give an order, when I say number one, number one really means the most important. The most important thing. Find something you love. Find something you love. Harvey McKay, who we've had at our programs, wonderful man, fascinating character. Lou Holtz's best friend. Says, find something you, lo you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life. How many of you have heard that? Let me see your hands. Okay. Let me just stop for a second and let me explain that quote. And how you've heard that phrase, and yet... It needs explanation. I love what I do. I am passionate about what I do. I've made it my life's work. My family is into it. I have a company of on fire, hundreds of employees that are passionate, fired up. You don't get people coming to say, we want to dance in the aisles and do this and do that and do that, and it's their idea if they feel like they're being mistreated and it's working at the DMV. Did you guys hear what I just said? But here is what you must understand. I don't love everything about what I do. Did you guys hear? I love what I do. I'm blessed. I get up every day. I say to the kids every morning, I, well, it's better than working for a living. Because when you're doing what you love, it doesn't feel like work. But understand this, not everything about what you love do you love. Okay? I've been all over the world. 
I've seen a lot of kitchens and dumpsters. That's what you see as a speaker, kitchens and dumpsters. I've been in the back of ballrooms all over the world, and just so you know, all kitchens and dumpsters look the same. It has involved a lot of travel. I haven't always loved being away from my family. I haven't always loved elements of the business. I haven't always loved parts of the recession. I haven't always loved letting people go. I haven't always loved the tough decisions that have had to be made. And in leadership, there's very few easy, good decisions. I don't love everything about it, but I love what I do. And I'm hoping that gives you some encouragement today. Because you hear this stuff, you just love what you do, you never work a day in your life, and you go, well, I don't love this. I don't love when the seller tries to cut my commission. I don't love when the other agent doesn't quite follow through. I don't love when this goes wrong. I don't love when the income's not there. I don't love when the cash reserves aren't there. I don't love this stress I'm feeling right now. I don't feel like I'm putting out of my, my life's a little out of control right now. I don't love that part of it. That's all the areas for improvement. You can love what you do. For some of you, you need to fall in love again. You need to go back to remembering why you got into this business and your career in the first place. And you need to fall in love again. And sometimes it produces, let's say you're in the real estate business and you go, you know what? One of my favorite things to do is hand in the keys to a brand new buyer seller that never thought they'd own a home. And you go, well, it, logically you go, man, I have a higher average sales price now, and I have this and that and the other. But you know what, sometimes, and I had this when I had a choice of leads, I go, I'm working with these. And it was twice as much work, and it was all the hand-holding, and I had to talk them down off the ledge half a dozen times. But I was there, hand them a set of keys. And it restored my love and joy for what I was doing. Sometimes you got to fall in love again. Are you guys with me? You don't have to love everything about it. Here's the key. What are you good at? What are you good at? That this is the, your life leads clues. Your life leaves clues. Your life will leave clues. Don't get all mysterious on yourself and you're blind or whatever else. Your life leaves clues. Here's the thing. You know when I first knew I could sell? I didn't know it at the time, but I was in the fourth grade. I was in Mrs. Kelly's class, and every kid was asked by Mrs. Kelly, what does your father do? In the culture I was in, fathers worked and moms were home with 17 children. <laughs> Catholic, Irish, alcoholic. Children, alcohol, that's what we do. <laughs> so Mrs. Kelly says, Brian, what does your father do? And I looked at her and I said, my father's a professional painter. She goes, what do you mean? Oh, well, he's a professional painter. You mean like an artist? I said, no, Mrs. Kelly. I said, there's a lot of people who have paintbrushes and station wagons, but I said, my father and his father before him and his father before him and his father before him, they are exceptional at what they do and they're very professional at what they do. And when we go to do a paint job, we we don't just paint the room, we change the light bulbs and we clean the windows to make sure the paint job looks fantastic. So my father's a professional painter. That night, nice. we had the only phone on our street. There were 48 homes on our street. We had one phone on the whole street. Phone rings. It's Mrs. Kelly wanting to speak to Mr. Buffini. Mr. Buffini gets the paint job to paint Mrs. Kelly's house. <laughs> well, wait. This is not a happy ending to this story. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly is delighted with the professional painters of Buffini and Company. She talks to the principal of the school. The principal of the school has George Buffini and Buffini and Company paint the school for the next 20 years. Every freaking summer holiday. <laughs> I spent four months at my bleeding school. But I realized I could sell. The next, it just, you'll, you'll see those pieces. You'll see those pieces. Okay? The next thing is, what do you, what do you enjoy? What do you enjoy doing? Okay, what do you enjoy doing? What do you enjoy doing? See, for me, it was always about people, and it was always some kind of commerce. So when I come to America, and I come here right off the boat, First thing I do, my brother had a clothing store up in L.A. I said, well, John, let me sell some T-shirts. So here's a picture where I started my American journey. This is on the corner of Garnett and Mission Bay Drive. 
And I, I just recently had a friend of mine send me these pictures. Here was a fella. I was selling T-shirts and sweatshirts. Now, this is where I started to think from a marketing perspective, okay? So, everybody was selling T-shirts down by the beach. But I started listening. People from Arizona, anybody here from Arizona? People from Arizona would come to California in August. It's 75 degrees in, Arizona, in California. It, they're 115. So they come, they're at the beach, gets a little cool in the evenings. They're like, do you have any sweatshirts? Do you have any sweatshirts? I get a bus. I drive up. I get a, a ride up to L.A. I clear out John's store of all of his sweatshirts. I come back on the public transportation with eight boxes, eight boxes this high on the bus. The month of August of 1986, I sold $50,000 worth of T-shirts and sweat tops off that cart. The Arizonans are, do you have any sweatshirts? I go, I might have a couple. <laughs> the last in stock. Find out what you like. Find out what you enjoy. Find out what you're good at. That's why you love it. Does that make sense? I, I, I love doing that stuff today as much as I did anything else. And I love being with the people, and I love face-to-face. -face. My favorite things about these events, I love doing it, but still when I get a chance to get out and about and hear people's stories and rub elbows and whatever else, it's still my favorite part of it. Here's the last part of this. What if you didn't need the money? What if you didn't need the money? What if you didn't need the money? What would you do if you didn't need the money? Now, it's a great place to be with. And here's the thing. I know you need the money. We all need the money. But what if you didn't need it? Would you do the job? Or would you do the part of it you love? Are you guys hearing me? Next. What makes you or your product or service unique? This is key. So find something you love, and then what makes you unique? What makes your product or service unique? Now, there's a key. Whatever product or service you have must answer this. You guys have heard me teach on this before, but it's very, very crucial. This is called WIFM. Okay? Do you know what this stands for? What's in it for me? Now, I want to take a moment on this because many people think this means what's in it for me? What's in it for me? I, I'm going to tell you, I have had many meetings with many corporations, and I will sit down sometimes with companies that talk about how to make, you know, they're talking about tens of millions of dollars and this and that and the other, and I can be in conversations for hours, and they never mention their customer. And they forget who their customer is. Uh, you, many of you know, our, we have a, sp a sponsorship relationship and a, a relate, great relationship with Wells Fargo. And, I, you know, we've been getting some feedback we're trying to help them with lately. And so there was a brand new president of Wells Fargo last week. And his first day on the job, he calls me. And we get an hour on the phone. He says, Brian, I want you to tell me like it is. What are the customers saying? What are the realtors saying? What do we have to do to be great? I want to know. I know we got some challenges. I know we, we're a big bank. I know we do a lot of good, but a little bit of bad can destroy it all. I want to hear from you. I want to hear from your realtors what's going on. And then he said this. Now, this is a guy that his division has 45,000 employees. They do $268 billion worth of loans a year. Okay? He said these words. Brian, without our customers, we're nothing. I went, I can work with this man. You hear me? Because that's not always what's said in corporate America. Without our customers, we're nothing. And the key is, they're asking. The customers are asking this question. Shout it out. The customer is saying, what's in it for me? The customer is saying, what's in it for me? The customer is saying, what's in it for me? And if you're meeting that market with, here's what's in it for me, you're dead. You might do short term. You might have a niche. You might do a, a sprint. You might take something and sell it. Fine. But you'll never build a sustainable, lasting business. What's in it for the end consumer? FedEx figured this out. FedEx took on the U.S. Postal Service. This was a startup company out of Tennessee. The stories of Fred Smith having to go and go to Vegas to try to make payroll. Now, that's not the all-in story we're looking for. <laughs> they were charging five times. With FedEx was five times the cost of an overnight letter than the U.S. Postal Service that's around since 1780-something and is a monopoly. And they took them on 
because they said, we think we're more in tune with our customers than you are. They actually ultimately changed the U.S. Postal Service. But their unique selling proposition, their USP, unique selling proposition, that answered the whiff and was, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, you call FedEx. And what did FedEx do? They introduced a tracking system. And you're sending your grandma's will, you're sending a deed, you're sending a check to a loved one in need, you're sending something vital, and they said, we'll track it for you so that you can have peace of mind. And people said, I'll pay for that. Is that true, yes or no? Did they answer the WIFM? Was there something in it for you, yes or no? Were they willing to pay? And then what happened is, they said, they said as a company, whatever it takes, we do that. We don't care what you have to do. And each person down the line of FedEx was authorized to, up to spend $25,000 to get a package delivered if they had to. So you have somebody making 20 bucks an hour who might make a $25,000 decision to get one package delivered that might be a $10 sale. Did you guys hear what I just said? So in New Hampshire, there's a blizzard. And there's a, a, a girl who's getting married. She gets her grandma's wedding dress, gets it fitted, supposed to be sent, it wasn't. And all of a sudden, they, they ship at FedEx. Blizzard blows in, everything's down. Driver stuck on the different side of town, calls and, buy, and rents a helicopter and delivers the wedding dress an hour before the wedding. The gal, her father, is a, the, the number one news anchor in New Hampshire, and they cover the story. A week later on the cover of every major newspaper in the United States is the story of how FedEx delivers a wedding dress when you absolutely positively have to get it there on time. And the rest, they say, is history. Are you guys with me? And people say, weren't they lucky? <laughs> That's what people think. Weren't they in the right place at the right time? Next, here we go. List the features and benefits that are unique about your product or service. Just list them out. What, what makes you unique? Are you a good negotiator? You have to be specific. I'm very caring. It's not enough. You got to, how are you caring? I provide good service. Doesn't mean anything. What does good service mean? Be specific. Okay? And it'll help you stand out amongst the crowd. Dr. Seuss said, why fit in when you were born to stand out? List out what makes you next. Great. B. What emotional need is being specifically met by your product or service? What emotional need? Okay? If you meet a transactional need, you will get paid. If you meet a transactional need, you get paid. When you meet an emotional need, you will create an advocate. Did you guys hear what I said? We get criticized because our customers are too excited about us. We get criticized, your people are over the top. Well, if people's lives change and they've been impacted and improved and it's happened over an extended period of years and years and years, people tend to get pretty sold on something. Does that make sense? C, identify aspects of your product or service that others would struggle to duplicate. Identify aspects of your product or service that others would struggle to duplicate. Identify aspects of your product or service that others would struggle to duplicate. Part of Buffini Company's uh, unique selling proposition, and we have a number of elements that are very hard to duplicate. Well, to start with, it would be this group of people right here. Our average coach, they work, we, we compete with people who have coaching, coaches who work from home who are part-time people. No offense, but part-time people aren't all in. They're not all trained. The average coach of a feeding company, 10.2 years. Most of our rivals aren't even in business that long. Okay? Uh, we have a system that was developed by somebody who actually did it. This is important. Okay? And it gets results. It's a duplicatable system. The latest numbers, as many of you know this, typical agent, sales agent in the National Association of Realtors last year made $35,000. And the Buffini Company coach sales agent made 290366 That's some serious butt kicking. There are parts of this that are very hard to duplicate. Very hard to duplicate. So we communicate and we articulate the things about our business that are hard to duplicate. Does that make sense? What about your business? And you have more of these than you think you do. 
The third major thing, the third step for an unstoppable business is the three words, promote, promote, promote. I have three quotes, and quotes are a big deal. We use them in our presentations. It's a huge deal for me. But I have three quotes that hang in my office. One is a quote from St. Irenaeus of Lyon that says, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. The second one is a quote from Michelangelo that said, Ancaro imparo, which says, I am still learning. The third quote that hangs in my office is from P.T. Barnum. And he said this, without promotion, something terrible happens. Nothing. Without promotion, something terrible happens. Nothing. You can be the greatest at what you have, but there's no point in being the biggest thing no one ever heard of or the most fantastic thing no one ever heard of. You need to joyfully and excitedly and enthusiastically promote yourself, your culture, your values. I'm going to give you some how-tos. Here's an example of this. Andrew Carnegie, okay, famous Carnegie Steel, built his first steel bridge in America in Pennsylvania, builds this fantastic bridge, this brand new technology, so much better than iron, so much more, just designed to last for centuries, and they couldn't get anyone in Pennsylvania to walk across it because people said it's going to crash, it's not strong enough, the currents will take it, I'm not going across it. And they built this bridge, nothing happening. Next, he's at the same time, he signs a contract to build the Brooklyn Bridge in New York of steel. Now, when they were in Pennsylvania, they came out and they had full-page ads in the newspaper showing the engineering stats. And they had engineers doing, uh, like they'd have them, they'd set up like little town hall meetings and explaining how steel was so much better than iron and all these different things, yada, yada, it didn't matter. And now he's panicking because he's going to build the most famous bridge in the world, practically. Californians would argue, but this, at the time, was the most famous bridge in the world, the Brooklyn Bridge. And as they near completion, he's freaking out because he goes, my gosh, no, no one's still using his Pennsylvania Bridge. So he meets with P.T. Barnum. And Barnum says, how much do you plan to spend advertising and justifying this bridge? And he gave him his budget. He said, all right, I'm fair with you. I'll take half. He said, you keep half, you give me the other half, and let me take care of it. So here's what P.T. Barnum does. He didn't tell anybody about the strength, the tankster, the tungsten, any of the engineering reports, because people buy emotionally and they justify logically. He didn't say, oh, let me appeal to the logic, 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 logic. Here's what he did. He held a giant circus parade all the way through New York. And in those days when they had a parade, everybody would follow the parade. So he has 21 elephants, including the largest elephant ever in human captivity, and they walk 21 elephants and the entire circus parade across the Brooklyn Bridge, and everybody followed the parade. Because if it's strong enough to hold 21 elephants, it might be strong enough to hold me, even if I occasionally eat a cookie or two. <laughs> Without promotion, something terrible happens. What is it? Nothing. So what do you promote? First, yourself. You got to promote yourself. Especially in our world today, you got to promote yourself. And this gets down into belief. Your belief determines your actions, said Mark Victor Hansen. He wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. And that determines your results. But first, you have to believe. Say the word believe. believe. You have to believe in your product or service. Do you believe in your product or service? Whatever it is you're selling. When I was selling real estate, here's the thing. To this day, I never met a piece of real estate I didn't like. When someone comes down the halls of Buffini and Company and they're a, a newer employee or whatever else, we're thinking about buying a home. <laughs> they're getting the whole treatment. You got to believe, but you got to promote. You can't just believe, you got to promote. You got to promote your clients and customers. You got to promote your clients' success stories. You got to promote what they do and how they do it. Many of you are in the real estate and mortgage businesses here today, and we go, I'm number one, and this and that, and that's what's been going on for years. People don't care who number one is. You need to promote your customers. That's why we do. We don't go around. We become the number one coaching and training company in North America, and we don't tell people, Brian Buffini's all that in a bag of chips. Here's what we do. We say, our clients are all that in a bag of chips. I'm, I'm going to show you a client story. A client story is a, as a, something to encourage you, but also something to have you do with your marketing, your promotion. 
we get clients on occasion who are in difficult circumstances. <laughs> the Johnsons come to us, and they had been doing real well in Florida, buying, fixing, and selling homes. Got into the flipping, building crews, whatever else. Got into the real estate business, the way they go, and all of a sudden, recession happens. Now they're hanging on for dear life. Now everything's starting to crumble. They end up having a short sale, 10 of their own properties, including their own home, their primary residence. They got IRS bills up the yin-yang, the whole thing. Now we teach people to set goals and to pursue those goals and then apply a system to reach those goals. So what happened? Working with their coach, they set a goal. They wanted to go sailing. They wanted to take a month off, and they planned it three years out. They're going to pay cash for a boat. They love sailing. And this is in the midst of losing their own home. Okay, what are the steps we got to take to get you on that boat? And I love promoting stories like this because it inspires people. It encourages people. And oh, by the way, people look at that and go, Buffini Company's not too bad if they can help people at that. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at the Johnsons. In 2000, I was the uh, vice president of engineering for a small telecommunications company. And when the telecom bubble bust, I got laid off. Uh, Gina was director of sales, and uh, she got laid off. So we said, what are we going to do? And we decided to do real estate investing, uh, buying and selling homes. And we made some good money on the first one, so we used our corporate background and uh, started buying some more, building crews. Uh, and flipping houses, and we did that for a couple of years. And uh, things were great. Until and the market crashed. Yeah. So we started asking ourselves many different kinds of questions. What could we have done differently? What could we have changed? What can we do moving forward to make things better? We tried everything. We cashed in our 401k. We tried to save everything we possibly could. We had to give eviction notices, which was very hard for me. I did not like the fact that I had to put someone out of their home. But we did everything we possibly could. So we knew it was bad when we were out of reserves and we used up all that money trying to maintain the mortgages on all the properties. We had 10 of them at the time. Um, and then we had to start doing short sales on all of those. So one by one, we learned how to do the short sale process. And we ended up going through 10 different short sales, including our primary, right? Um, it was a hard time. I remember the day we got the IRS letter and it said we owed $85,000 in IRS debt. Um, that wasn't a very good sleepless night that night for sure. When Tim and Gina came to me, there was still a lot to overcome. They had recently gone through all the short sales, were buried in debt, uh, acquired a new brokerage, but they weren't quite profitable. We changed our focus a bit, and we focused more on their production and then setting minimum standards for their team. What really turned things around is we always had our eye on the prize. With the help of Cami and the coaching and the goals that we put together, we were able to get all the debt paid off. Uh, we worked with our accountant and the IRS to get all that resolved and began rebuilding everything slowly but surely. Within the next couple of years, we set out and accomplished all the goals we put our mind to, and that got us on the path towards our dream. I'll never forget the day that they notified me. Cami, we bought the sailboat, we paid cash, and we didn't touch our reserves. We're the Johnsons, and we're living the good life.
And you'll see they sent me a note. They sent me a note I'm going to share with you. And it's from the deck of 1440, which is the number of their boat. They see the picture of the boat on there. It says, Brian, a quick note to let you know we're living the dream and having a blast. The uh, above boat is our boat. Note cards provided by my mother. This trip has exceeded our expectations. Amazing to be allowed to have this much fun. Thanks for your company and team and personal commitment. You provided us with this opportunity. It's a good life, Tim and Gina. P.S. January is going to be our second best month ever, and we're not even there. <laughs> Tim and Gina are with us here today. Great story. We're very proud of you guys. Where Tim and Gina? Where are you guys at? Where is Tim and Gina? Out there somewhere around. Oh, you got them. There they are. Hey, guys. Here's the thing. Let me, let me say this to you. You've got to joyfully and happily promote what you do and how you do it, especially if you're the real deal. You need to do that. You need to do that. Because you do this, you go into people's homes, you change people's lives, you serve your customers spectacularly, and you've got you to let people know that. The, the only way you can demonstrate that you care is tell your customers stories. Fourth, you got to sell with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. you got to have it. Enthusiasm. Another little acrostic. It's a great teaching. What does it stand for? You guys know this. I am sold myself. If you want to reach more people, if you want to have more success stories of people you've served, you've got to sell with enthusiasm. You've got to sell with enthusiasm. You've got to have a little juice. Sometimes we get beat up and burned out. Sometimes you've had a bad appointment and you go on the next appointment and you bring the bad appointment with you and you show up like an undertaker. <laughs> Too many offers right now. It's a tough market, tough market, I tell you, a tough market. Not sure I'd be selling if I were you, to be honest with you. It's a brutal process, brutal. <laughs> Let me tell you, appraisers, I don't even think they go to heaven. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> no chance. You got to bring the juice. You got to bring the juice. You got to be enthusiastic. First, you got to do is believe in yourself. You got to believe in yourself. I learned this from my first mentor, the great Gene Kuhlman. When I was a baby agent, Gene took me under his arm and I'd follow him around. And Gene would walk into a house and he'd walk into a home and he'd say, nice to meet you. I got a young man with me today. He's going to be with us. Why don't you give me the tour of the home? Show me. Give me the A tour. And Gene would walk around the house and he'd point out all these little features. He'd walk around, oh yeah, fireplace, nice. Skylights, great. Two-car garage, like that. Bay window, very nice. And then he'd bring them all back, and when we got back, he'd have, take a seat. He'd take control of the point, take a seat. And they'd sit down at the table, and before he sat down, he'd have his hands on the back of the chair, and he'd go, this is going to sell. And every time he said it, the people go, really? Because he just brought that enthusiasm. Of course it's going to sell if you price it right and promote it. <laughs> right? Hello? But, you know, and I was a rookie. I didn't, I, I got the words. I had the words of the song, but I didn't know the rhythm. So I didn't bring that spirit. So Gene finally lets me go on an appointment by myself. So I walk in. I go, give me the tour. But I was nervous and scared. I didn't have that enthusiasm. So all of my observations sounded like questions. <laughs> Fireplace? <laughs> the skylight? Uh, garage? We get, I'm flustered. I know this isn't going well. They're looking at me, what the heck? They're going in, going in. We get to the table. I sit down, they're still standing, and I go, is this house going to sell? <laughs> that one never commissioned out. <laughs> Got to bring the juice. Sugar Ray Robinson said this, to be the champ, you have to believe in yourself when no one else will. You got to walk in the door, you got to look your customer in the eye, and you got to say to yourself, it's your lucky day. Do not say it out loud. <laughs> you got to sell with enthusiasm. You got to believe in your product or service. You got to believe in it. If you don't believe in it, don't sell it. I've met people who are doing certain things. You know, I'll give you examples. I've had people who are uh, selling a security system. 
and that this company targeted elderly people. And the security system was like $2,500 and this and that and the other. They've been huge commissions. And it turns out you could actually, if you looked around, you could get the kind of the same service for about 190 bucks and, and an awful lot less money. And there was this salesman, and he's, he's doing this, and he's asking me for advice, and the guy had no conviction. I go, let me ask you this. Do you believe in cheating people? He goes, no, I mean, there is benefits. I go, let me ask you this. Do you believe in what you're selling? He said, no. I said, then, well, there's no amount of money that you can be paid. You got to believe in it. You got to believe in it and go somewhere else. You can make a fortune. It's not hard. Not hard to make a fortune. But you better bring the belief with you. If you make a fortune and don't have the belief, you'll lose yourself. And there's nothing wrong with selling. Ladies, how many of you wear the makeup here today? Can I see your hands? You ever heard of Estee Lauder? Okay. Now, this is a revolutionary woman. Well, long before women were in the marketplace, Estee Lauder was out there in New York City. And here was the quote best described to Estee Lauder. She goes, I never worked a day in my life without selling. If I believe in something, I sell it, and I sell it hard. The number one thing she was selling was herself. And many of you go, no, I don't use Estee Lauder products. I go DKNY, I go to Clinique, I go to Cal Coach, I go to... Estee Lauder owns all the brands. They just let you feel like you're having a choice. <laughs> C, believe in your clients and customers. Believe in your clients and customers. This is the hard part. I'm going to tell you the flaw in the system I teach. It's this, trust. The system I teach is for people who are going to trust their customers. And I have to trust that I'm going to pour myself into you, that I'm going to give you all my energy and time and effort, and I'm going to exceed your expectations. And I have to trust that you are going to be so fired up about me, you're going to tell your friends. And I'm going to pour myself in the next couple. And here's the thing, some of them will refer you all day long, and some of them won't refer you at all. You don't stop trusting. And some will refer you to people you never even thought you'd meet, and away you go. You have to trust that when you pour yourself into people, they're going to refer you. Does that make sense? At Buffini and Company, when we first started, I had consultants come. And they said, well, what's your marketing model? And I said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to build it from the ground up. And they said, we're going to pour ourselves into the real estate and lending communities and we're going to exceed their expectations, we're going to help them change their businesses, and that will change their lives. And then they're going to tell their friends. And every consultant I had through the door said this, why would an independent contractor who's doing really well with your system tell a colleague in their office who's a competitor, why would they tell their competitor about you? I said, well, you've got to understand our philosophy is we believe they have their own database. They're going to just do great with their own database. They're going to have more than they can handle, and their life is going to change, and they're going to tell their friends because they want to. And every consultant said that has no chance of working. Buffini and Company grew by no less than 40% a year for 10 consecutive years without $1 of advertising. We never advertised $1 with no ads, no, none, zero, as a company. And by the way, thank you for your referrals. <laughs> I'm not the first guy to think of this. You ever heard of Walt Disney? Walt Disney was in the referral business. He was also in the promotion side of things. But here's what Walt Disney, number one quote, do what you do so well that they'll want to see it again and bring their friends. It works. Number five, exceed customers' expectations. You've got to exceed their expectations. Let me tell you, the worst thing you can have happen is a satisfied customer. You've got to exceed customers' expectations. If people just get what they paid for, it's a transaction. They walk, you walk into a restaurant, and they, you order a chicken Caesar salad, and it shows up, and it's pretty good. You pay the bill, you go away. You go into the same restaurant. You ordered a chicken Caesar salad. They notice you're wearing dark pants, and they go, oh, let me get you a dark napkin. They come on over and say, you know what? We actually are, we got a special coming up this afternoon, which I want you to have a little sample of it. This has been bred into me. The Mr. Miyagi 
of the Buffini family is this man right here. This is the man that shaped all of our lives. That is Harry Buffini. By the way, doesn't he look like the ultimate paisano? <laughs> look at the head of hair on him. Look at that nose. The man could smoke in the shower. <laughs> My mother always said he had such a Roman nose. Look at the plastic on the furniture that we all lived on. <laughs> I don't know what we were saving it for. But Harry Buffini trained all of us kids. Eight years of age, you went to work inside the Buffini family business and you went to work with Harry. And he taught you how to hold a paintbrush properly. He taught you how to sand. All of us have no fingerprints. We are like the mafia. We have no fingerprints left. All the Buffini brothers, sand and doors. We used to sing songs to it. Me and my shadow. Oh, this is what you do when you do that for six months. And he taught us the skills, and he taught us the craft, and he taught us how to do it. He taught us how to be professional painters. And when you got old enough and good enough, you got to go on the job, and Harry would be there. And Harry would circle you, and then he'd leave you. And at the end of the day, he'd come back and he'd ask you the one question. He'd have a stogie in his hand. He smoked the cheapest cigars alive called Castellas. Every time I sell, smell cigar smoke, I think of Harry. And he'd just point at your work, and he'd say, well, Brian, can you put your name to that? Can you put your name to that? He was asking, could you put his name to it? And if you couldn't put your name to the work you'd done, guess what you had to do? The customer didn't complain. The customer never saw it. But Harry Buffini said, that doesn't meet our standard. And our standard is we exceed customers' expectations. And when we exceed their expectations, they tell their friends. And that's why we changed the light bulbs and that's why we painted the windows, or cleaned the windows. I painted the windows, <laughs> then I cleaned them. <laughs> I'd often see this. My dad, we used to do these, there's these fantastic buildings in Dublin. There's the famous Doors of Dublin. And if you look this up, you'll see the Doors of Dublin. Well, the Buffini family painted every one of them. And there are these four-story Georgian buildings. And we would use gold leaf and all the different, we did all the embassies in Dublin. And we would sometimes be brought in to do a job in my, in my, with like one room. And I said, Dad, what are we doing here? And I would say this, because I was doing the family's books early on. I go, Dad, why are we doing this? And he goes, son, to paint this room, we've got to paint the outside door. We've got to paint the door out to the hall. You can't just paint one side of a door. You've got to paint both of them. And then the rest of it's going to look terrible. <laughs> and they would bring us in to paint one room, and we would paint the whole building. We were like termites. Once we got in, you never got us out. <laughs> now, if you have a chance to tour Buffini and Company today, you'll see the Buffini and Company sign from 1947 hanging in the hallway. There they are, decorators, Buffini and Company. The truth of the matter, when they, they had a sign first, they had an address on it, no phone number. You had to write a note to Mr. Buffini for in order to come over and have him give you an estimate. We used to have our customers write us notes. That's good. And so all I try to do today at Buffini & Company is to continue the legacy. Here's my dad, my hero, my dad, 84 years of age, has the dietary habits of Willy Wonka. He's the fittest, most flexible, healthiest man I know, totally destroys everything I know about health and wellness. <laughs> but all we're trying to do is keep the tradition alive. How do you do it? How do you exceed the customer's expectation? First of all, you notice a need. Notice a need. Notice a need. I helped a young couple buy their first home, Tom and Lisa Clark. My brother Kevin was my assistant at the time. Tommy traveled a lot. Lisa, and they didn't have a lot of money. We fell in love with this couple. We were doing a lot of deals. There was no way they could get into the house. We made this happen. We did a commission-free deal. We got them into the house. They had, a, they had a newborn baby, about six, seven months old, severe scoliosis of the spine. Tommy travels all the time. Well, on the day people moved into their home, we would bring them foods. So we would show up right around moving time and bring them food, set up a table, bring them food. It didn't matter if I was doing 20 deals in a month. It didn't matter what we had going on. We took time to do that. So we drive up to Tom and Lisa Clark's home, and we pull up into the driveway. There's a U-Haul in the driveway. Lisa's sitting on the curb with the baby in her arms, bawling her eyes out. Lisa, what's up? She goes, well... Our neighbors helped me pack up. Tommy's gone for 13 days. She goes, my family's supposed to come and help me unpack, and they flaked. 
They're not coming. They won't answer their calls. And I'm all by myself. And she's just beside herself. Now, Kevin and I have a list of appointments. We're sitting here with pizzas and sandwiches. <laughs> all right. We go, all right, Lisa, we've got stuff to do, but let me ask you this. What would be the one thing we could do right now to get you squared away so at least you could have some kind of night, all right? So we, we unpacked everything out and got it into the garage. She goes, can we get the baby's room set up? Can you get the baby's room set up? I'm like, all right. So here's me and Kevo. You remember, Kev? So all of a sudden, here it is, skin and hair flying. We're putting it together. We're putting together this crib. Now, just so you know, my wife will tell you I'm not Mr. DIY. And we are putting this thing together, and it looks like a, a, an octopus making love to a set of bagpipes. There's stuff flying everywhere. <laughs> There's all kinds of parts and this and that and the other. But we got that crib together. We got that room put together. We spent hours. We had to cancel appointment after appointment after appointment. We did the best we could. And the next day, we called up a couple of buddies in the area, paid them 50 bucks each, and they helped her. Now, here's what I want to tell you. That transaction took an awful lot of work. They didn't have any money, and I made no commission on the deal. I'm going to tell you this. People, don't, people forget if you give them a discount on your fees. Lisa Clark became one of my greatest advocates. And every time she talked to people, she said, let me tell you about my realtor. When we were all by ourselves, and it was just me and the baby, they put the baby's room together and built the crib. And every time I got a referral from Lisa Clark, dozens and dozens of referrals for years and years and years, Lisa told me about what you did. It was a simple thing. It was noticing a need. It was filling a need. Here's the thing. If you get your eyes off yourself and get your eyes up onto other people's needs, and Zig Ziglar says you help people get what they want, you'll get plenty of what you want. Does that make sense? Next, take a personal interest. Take a personal interest. Take a personal interest. The CEO of Mission Federal Credit Union, the largest financial institution in San Diego County at the time, a three-piece suit wearing man in a sandals and shorts wearing city. Formal wear in San Diego is no shoes, no shirt, no service. This guy wore a three-piece suit. He was, I got a referral from a roofer to go and I handled all of their foreclosures. They would put their properties in pristine condition and he would encourage me to market and promote them before they went on the market. 70% of the properties I did for Mission Federal Credit Union, I sold before they ever went on the market. I'm sitting down, I'm spending time with my best customer, investing in my best customer. And I'm asking, how are you doing? How's your life? What's going on? Not about where's your foreclosures? What more can I get? What more can I get? How are you doing? What's on? And he tells me that he and his wife are sending their only son off to college. And he just kind of moves on. He's kind of a button-down guy. But I kept asking because I want to know where he's coming from. And I go, well, how do you feel about that? He goes, I'm a little scared, to be honest with I'm a little nervous. You know, it's like I feel like I'm throwing him to the wolves a little bit. I'm not sure how he's prepared. And he says, on top of that, Marsha and I are looking at having the empty nest. And I've heard all about it, but I don't know what it is. Now, back in the day, there wasn't Amazon. I leave that appointment. I have a list of appointments to go to. I leave. Now, listen to me. I leave. My phone is ringing. My assistant is calling. I'm at a bookstore. I'm at a bookstore. I just heard a need. I just heard a need. I want to take a personal interest. I just heard a need. And I'm looking up and down the aisles. My assistant's calling. Where are you? Where are you? Mrs. Maselli's roof is leaking. Where are you? Where are you? Are you golfing? <laughs> and I find two books, How to Prepare Your Child for Their First Year of College and How to Fill the Empty Nest. I have those two books. I write a personal note. I call up my courier service. We have them couriered over to Frank Simon's office before 5 o'clock that day. Frank Simons, this button-down banker, calls me at five minutes to five, and he goes, Brian, I just want to, and he couldn't say another word. Everybody's got needs, and people are inspired when you demonstrate your care. Are you guys with me? You want to make your business big, make your focus small. Harry Buffini was right. And then give something extra. Give something extra. Give something extra. Okay? Give something extra. 
We do Popeyes. How many of you do Popeyes? Let me see your hands. Bring in a little gift, saying hello. In the service industry, you can do this, but there's many ways to do it. Bring in a little gift, bring in a little gift. So here's a neat story. We teach people to go and bring Popeyes. We have all the tools for it. Here's the little tags, and here's the ideas, and here's what you can do. And so here's an example of one of our clients earlier this year. So earlier this year, brutal winter in the Northeast. How many of you are in the Northeast? Brutal. Can you send some of the rain to the West? People freezing their bones off. So I got this message from one of my clients, Carol McDonald. She took this little tag we gave her. I'm happy to provide great clients with you a clearer view of the market. Oh, by the way, I'm never too busy for any of your referrals. She went out and she delivered uh, windshield washer fluid and, and uh, delivered them to 63 people over the course of three days. Ice scraper, bottle of fluid, three bucks a piece, got nine referrals. All of her competition was complaining about the weather. All the competition's indoors, watching social media. She went out, three days, 63 people, nine referrals. In Stone of Mass, where the average sales price is pretty high, that's a sixty or $70,000 week, giving something extra. Number six, crucial, keep in touch, keep in touch. In America, when you do business with people, they forget you, or they hand you over to a call center, or robos, or whatever. Keep in touch, that shows that you care. You keep in touch with people you care about. Now, we've systemized it so you don't have to be all consumed, so you can still do a lot of business, but keep in touch. Victor Hugo said this. He wrote Les Mis. When a man is out of sight, it's not too long before he's out of mind. What do you do? First, provide value. Provide value. Albert Einstein said, strive not to be a success, but rather to be of value. Guy was good. Here's a little thing. This will be a different spin. How many of you in here, by a show of hands, I'll be curious to see this on camera. How many of you in here, show of hands, receive these marketing pieces from us? We give you the items of value every month. How many of you get them? Let me see your hands. Do your customers like getting them? Okay. So you provide something of value. So here's facts about your credit. Here's how to protect yourself from identity theft. Every month, something of value. E-reports, things in the mail, personal notes, something of value. Providing, providing, providing value. You want to know how it works? Let me tell you what you're responsible for. You probably don't know this about yourself. Just Buffini and Company's clients who are in our membership and the people we train every year, like through Peak Producers, this year will be responsible for 625,000 transactions. You want to know what that looks like? There'll be 4.9 million sales this year. That's 12.7% because you don't multiply by three. One out of every eight homes sold in this country are sold through you people. We provide you the resources and you send them out. We're like the Intel chip in your Dell computer. So think about this. This is what you do, but also this is what Buffini and Company does using these principles. Does that make sense? We're a little company that has this massive impact using these principles. We stay in contact with you. We teach you to stay in contact with them. Does this make sense? And it works. And it works. Second piece here, point B, is you got to be consistent. You can't do it once in a while. You can't keep in touch and then do it one time. Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. Last part, you got to employ a system. You got to have a system. System. We invest, we keep investing. Right now, I just wrote and committed to a, a seven-figure number to take what we currently have with our contact management system and to make it the premier contact management system in the marketplace. And we just signed off on millions of dollars of my children's inheritance <laughs> to do that. So thank you, kids. We don't say, we don't just give you ideas. We say, send this stuff out. So when you say you provide a system, so you have to have a system for how you close. You have to system how you care. We provide you a lot of systems, but you got to have a system. That means if you have a system, you can be consistent. Does that make sense? I know, by the way, folks like this don't hurt in our, in our business. Coaches to help you be consistent. Sometimes you need to coach your client. Sometimes you need to be the coach to your customer. Does that make sense? Number seven. My favorite part. But you got to do the other six to get here. Everybody wants to get to heaven. No one wants to die to get there. 
Number, you got to do the first six to get to number seven. And in today's world, everybody talks about this right here. And everybody, listen, everybody wants to start here. That's why everybody thinks they can use just social media and just online marketing to build their business. I'm telling you right now, it's a trap. Number seven is you build a community of advocates, a community of people, relationships. When you get your customers interacting with one another, that's when the magic happens. My favorite thing about what we do is getting you people together, whether it's in our small groups, whether it's at mixers, whether it's at parties, whether it's at events, whether it's through the referral directory where you exchange business with one another, where the relationships that you've formed. How many of you in here have formed a great friendship with someone in this community? Let me see your hands. Look around. Spectacular. Jane Howard said, call it a clan, call it a network, call it a tribe, call it a family, whatever you call it. Whoever you are, you need one. Here it is. Reach out to your A-plus clients. Reach out to your A-plus clients. I have so many, but this is something I'm really on a mission to do in many different ways. It's kind of my version of the secret millionaire. I'm going to start doing all kinds of this stuff. You'll never know where I'm going to show up. I'm like Cato in the Peter Sellers movies. I'm going to come out of the fridge. So the first of these just happened. We have a wonderful uh, mortgage consultant in Carlsbad named Cheryl Sutcliffe. Great lady, Wells Fargo lass, gets it, works by referral, spectacular business. And she facilitates a peak producers class all the time. She's putting realtors that she cares for through the training programs. And so I, she called the office and said, hey, I've done a bunch of these. I'd love to have someone from Buffini Company pop by. So we did a pop by. We let her know about five minutes before so she wouldn't soil herself. <laughs> and, but watch this. I, this is me doing a little Popeye. Lots of these coming up. This is kind of fun stuff. Let's take a look. Good morning. doing the things you need to do when you don't feel like doing them. That's what sets us apart. <laughs> when you do a pop you got to bring a little item of value, right? <laughs> so I have a book for each one of you. I signed your name to it. Oh. Oh. So you guys can touch at the end. And it makes you feel good, doesn't it? Sure. Yes. Yes. God bless you guys. Oh. Okay. Oh. Sure beats working for a living, doesn't it? Here's the thing, that made my day. So be watching for Kato coming out of a refrigerator somewhere near you. The next thing is connect your clients with each other. Connect your clients with each other. Many different ways to do this. You can do this through online, you can do this through mechanisms, you can do it through get-togethers, you can do it through client appreciation parties, many different weather. Get them together and the magic starts to happen. We get our clients, you guys, you guys get together all the time. You're all over North America. There's thousands and thousands of you guys. You network, we get you together. You're able to reach one another through referrals, through networks. How many of you have received a referral through someone in the network? Let me see your hands. So you do business together. We have a members lounge at the Success Tour so you guys can get together just as members to kibbutz and get together. You guys do put on parties yourselves. You guys are connecting online. Oh, look at this. Here's Joe doing his thing right here. Okay? You guys are connecting and interacting. He's got a map in his office of all of where you guys are and all his relationships are. The magic happens when you get your customers together. By the way, listen to me. If you're afraid to get your customers together, you got other problems. <laughs> Lastly, seven steps to an unstoppable business in the modern world we live in. You got to create tech connections. And as much as Buffini and Company is old school relationships, look them in the eye. Can you put your name to that? As much as Buffini and Company is that, we also use more technology than hardly anybody. When we do an event, we'll do an event and we'll broadcast to 2,000 locations simultaneously. Okay, we use all kinds of technology. We use social media very well as a supporting piece to the community. And I'm going to give you five ways to connect. You might want to write these down. It's not in your book, so just find a place in the margins. 
So five ways to connect so, uh, to, the, to the modern media. First is events. So if you have an events, post something about that. Uh, video. You got some cool, funny, non-goofy video. And I mean by that is it's not going to alienate people. So it can be fun, it can be interesting, but it just can't alienate people. You can create tech connections by letting people into your life a little bit. Some of your personal stuff. Okay? Some of your personal stuff. And keep your clothes on for the love of Mary. <laughs> Next, education. Education. Informative stuff, good stuff. And then inspirational, motivational quotes. You put together this soup, you put together this little broad spectrum, you will create. So I'm going to show you some examples, and those words will show up again. Okay, but I'm going to show you examples, and you'll see the numbers that we receive so you can actually see what people respond to the most. Now, I'm going to tell you, you need to do it all, but you'll see the things, because if you just do one and you go, that's the big response, I'll just do that, then people tune it out. So you've got to give it a little variation. Are you guys with me? So here's an example, creating technical connections. So last year's Mastermind, we took some pictures and sent out kind of some images to people. And you can see 25,000 people reached that way. So that's how many people were interested in that. But because one of the things is, I wasn't at the event, I'm not as interested. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so then video. Video's a great way. We'll have some training videos, some entertaining stuff, funny story, whatever else. So you can see now here, the numbers are different. 97,000 people reached there. Personal stuff. Okay, let people into your life. The day AJ and Nicole got married, 129,000 people on their wedding day wanted to see that picture. Okay. Education, valuable stuff, practical stuff. So you'll see we'll reach 167,000 people that way. Now this might surprise you, but the inspirational quotes and all that kind of stuff, that's really where the tech connections are made. Look at that, 267,000 people. So people really share that stuff, they really connect. So events, education, your personal life, valuable information, inspirational quotes, good stuff. And that's a great little formula for it, and you can layer that out as you will without leaving your main job. By the way, it's, it's point seven point C. You got to do all the other stuff. In the world today, no, I just want to do that stuff. You do that stuff, you will be hashtag broke. <laughs> what did I talk about? Find something you love. Find something you love. You can love lots of things. Okay? I loved real estate. Made it a family business. When I started to really grow the business, then I started to systemize it. So I had assistants. I was the first guy in San Diego with a team. This is Pat Moore. She was just my transaction coordinator. I had a team in 1990. No one knew what to do with me. My broker, I almost had a heart attack. Teams are fashionable today. I'm talking 25 years ago. And then I systemized it, and I systemized it to the point that it was duplicatable, and they'd ask me to come to conferences and share what I was doing at real estate conventions, and I did. And people said, I want more. So then I started out, and some of you met me on days like this, sharing about this simple little system, which was totally contrary to the culture. The culture was teaching, find them, fleece them, forget them. Get in, get out, get gone. Cold call, door knock, your clients don't have to be your friends. Get out. And I was teaching, build relationships, connect. I was sharing these seven principles. So I did a lot of these. In ballrooms like this, slept in a lot of crappy hotels. Shared a room with my brother Kevin on the road. Lots and lots of stories I could share. <laughs> he and I traveled for four and a half years together. Did over a thousand seminars together. Okay, one of the people who built Buffini and Company, Kevin Buffini, absolutely. <laughs> We started out in a little hole in the wall. We had six people, 1,000 square feet. We used to have a mat that said, wipe your feet on the way out, don't dirty the street. <laughs> then we realized this isn't going anywhere unless we promote. So then we took over the top floor of a building on Postal Way, and we used to always say, don't make me go postal on you. But we built a promotions team that would call people to come to a free event. We we're going to give you value. We're going to give it away. We're going to give it away and see if people see any value in it. And that's what we did. We were called Providence back then. This is the original team from 1997. Twelve of those people are still with us today. And we promoted and we promoted and it grew and it grew and more people told people. So we needed more space and we got bigger buildings. 
But we kept the main thing, the main thing. We moved to Palomar Oaks Court and we promoted some more. I went out and I didn't just wait for it to happen. 1,200 half-day events, 380 cities, okay? That's 1,900 nights away from home. And we gave it away for free and we provided value. Back in the day, people would go to a free four-hour seminar and some guy on stage would sell for four hours. And we came and we spent two hours and 15 minutes. And we provided value, we gave people workbooks, we gave people free marketing materials for two hours and 10 minutes. And I would spend four and a half minutes telling people about what we had and what if they were interested. But we provided so much value. This typical seminar speaker at the time was signing up 8% of an audience. I averaged for 16 years signing up 42% of every audience I ever spoke to and it was because we provided value first. And people respond to value. These seven principles, I'm not some guy writing a book who's never freaking done a thing in his life. I'm sharing with you these things. And I've never told you guys the Buffini Company story because you're the Buffini Company customers. We did 450 two-day turning point events. How many of you have been to a turning point event? And we did these all over Kingdom Come. I've done hundreds of special events all over the world. Sharing the message, grinding it out, being consistent, and being fueled every day. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Let me tell you where the fuel is, and if you have this in your business, you'll be fine. But there was one day in my life, in this business, that changed my life, and I went up to Seattle, Washington. Hey, hey. I was at the Maidenbauer Center. We had a guy who was the head of our promotions team at the time, and he let me down. He was having all kinds of substance issues and whatever else we didn't know about. I'm supposed to see 800 people. I spent all this money and whatever else. He was taking the money. They weren't using the money. And I show up to the Maidenbauer Center. I've got a, a room kind of about half this size, and we have 32 people show up and 768 empty seats. And we're like, what are we going to do? I'm outside having a chat with my brothers, and we had a conversation. And they gave me some feedback. They said, Brian, you always said, no matter what, if there's one person in the room who needs our help, we go to work. Let's go. We closed the room many times, <laughs> put the chairs in a little semicircle, had ourselves a little Bible study. <laughs> right before I get up on the power stage, which I finally did the seminar from the ground, a woman walks up to me. Her name is Jeannie Vance. And Jeannie Vance said, I'm a seminar junkie, and whatever you're selling today, I'm buying it. <laughs> so after two hours and 15 minutes of the greatest stuff I have on earth, one person signed up that day, Jeannie Vance. <laughs> Jeannie Vance was a single mom. She had a couple of kids. She had a husband that was abusive, left her high and dry. She got into real estate business. She didn't like how she was being taught how to do the business because she was a highly relational person. And she took her last $395 on this planet to sign up to go to our seminar. Ten years later, Jeannie Vance had built a business and had pursued her dream. And her dream was to live and retire for the rest of her life in Hawaii. And ten years, almost to the day, Jeannie Vance set up her brokerage in Hawaii where she now lives and will live for the rest of her life. You see, at the end of the day, I can speak to ballrooms and I can speak to convention centers and I can speak in stadiums where there's 10 and 20,000 people. But when I go into a room, when I prepare content, I am looking to impact Jeannie Vance and here's what happens. When people come away from an event I'm speaking at, they say, he was just talking to me. Now, I work hard to do that. But as long as that's the driving force in my business, then I'm going to be successful. As long as that's the driving force in your business, you're going to be successful. No matter what the market's doing, no matter how much income's coming in, you will succeed. At Buffco, here's what it looks like today. Here's our main headquarters, if you get a chance. Across the street, we have our sales headquarters, and we are doing training and encouragement all the time. We have our TV studio where we broadcast and podcast out of. And then the place you all never get to see but touches every single person in this room is our warehouse staff. Now, we have core values. Excellence is our minimum standard. Live what we teach. Practice servant leadership. Those are our three core values. When you understand that everybody gets connected to the mission, that we're looking for Jeannie Vance, we're impacting the proven lives of people, this is what happens. 
Years ago, our warehouse staff paid and created their own sign that goes on the warehouse door when they're shipping stuff out every day. And here's the sign on the door. And it says, Excellence Departing. They came up with that. And now we've seen 3 million people in 37 countries. But at the end of the day, we're looking to help one. What I want to share with you is I'm the nose on the airplane, but our mission is to impact and improve the lives of people. And that we have stayed true to for 20 years and will, Lord willing, for generations to come. I'm the nose on the airplane. I'm obviously the big mouthpiece, but these are the folks that make it happen. And um, that's where it's at. And the people we make it happen for is you.